Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Um, just another quick reminder that we invite you uh, to update your name with your pronouns if you'd like, and you can do that by hovering over your picture, clicking on the three dots and choosing the rename option. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dubs Weinblatt. My pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I'm the Associate Director of Education and Training for Metro New York at Keshet. Uh, and if you are unfamiliar with Keshet, we will tell you all about it in just a minute. Uh, but before we go any further, I want to introduce, uh, invite invite my colleague, Micah, Rabbi Micah, to introduce himself uh, before we keep going. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I am Rabbi Micah Bakia L. I use he, him, or they, them pronouns, and I'm the Director of Education and Training with Keshet. And we are thrilled to be part of the Trans Jews Are Here convening with CBST this year and to do some learning about allyship with you all. Uh, and Zora, I will pass it to you. Great. Thanks, Micah. Hi, everyone. My name is Zora Berman. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And my role at Keshet is the Education Program Associate. And so happy to um, be here for this session and for this day. Thanks so much. Thank you, Zora. Um, so uh, before we kind of dive into our whole workshop on allyship, um, I wanted to, to name and bring to everyone's attention um, the anti-trans legislation that has been uh, circulating around this country. Um, over half of the states um, have introduced anti-trans legislation looking to uh, ban trans children from playing in sports, uh, um, uh, taking away trans affirming health care uh, from kids and from some trans adults uh, from trans adults in some states. Um, and so uh, wanting to name that as we were entering into different spaces on this beautiful day of trans day of visibility, knowing that lots of uh, trans and non-binary people are holding that with them. Um, and that as allies, we invite you, if you didn't know about that, to start researching um, the issues and um, the things that are deeply and personally and directly impacting uh, the trans and non-binary communities. Um, so, okay, so uh, let's, uh, if you don't mind, Micah, going to the next slide. Uh, so I mentioned Keshet. Keshet uh, works for the full equality of all LGBTQ Jews and our families in Jewish life. Uh, we strengthen Jewish communities. We equip Jewish organizations with the skills and knowledge to build LGBTQ affirming communities, create spaces in which all queer Jewish youth feel seen and valued and advance LGBTQ rights nationwide. Uh, and you can learn more about us at www.keshetonline.org. Uh, and again, just so, so thrilled to be here with all of you today. Ah, amazing. Um, just to get everybody oriented to what we're going to accomplish or what we hope to accomplish in the two hours that we have together, um, I want to share with you that you are the first group to be learning together with us um, this particular training. It's a brand new training that we have developed uh, specifically for CBST and for the Trans Jews Are Here Convening Allyship Track. Um, and we are very eager and enthusiastic to welcome feedback, questions, ways in which we can continue to sharpen this training content. Uh, but what we hope we will, accomplish, we will accomplish in two hours together is uh, build a common definition of LGBTQ and particularly trans allyship. Uh, work on approaching allyship with a, gr with a growth mindset. We're going to talk a little bit about what that means. Um, approach allyship from a framework of authentic relationships with and accountability to LGBTQ people that are most directly impacted by bias and oppression. Um, recognize some ways in which biases around gender and sexual orientation, although we're going to be both focusing primarily on gender in this training space, uh, impact LGBTQ individuals in communal and organizational settings. And uh, the heart of this is to really work on beginning to effectively intervene uh, when witnessing or when present for micro behaviors, barriers to access, and uh, incidents of homophobia or in particular transphobia. It's a little bit of an ambitious agenda. We have built a break into the middle. We also understand that all of us are here um, in bodies with needs. And if you need to go off video, if you need to step out, if you need to take care of anything during the course of these two hours, please feel free to do it. Um, and we are being recorded and live streamed. So if there is a moment that you want to go back and rewatch or if you've had to step out, please know that that will be available to you. 
So uh, we want to introduce some kava note or intentions for our learning space together here today, create a container for our learning. Um, as Micah mentioned, uh, attending this with a growth and learning mindset, um, you're here to learn. Um, and so uh, really approaching it with, um, with this uh, particular intention will be helpful for that. Um, take space, make space. Um, we are excited to hear from each and every one of you if you want to share. Um, I know for me, sometimes when I get really excited, I want to be the first to talk every time uh, and want to be mindful that uh, that dynamic then makes it impossible for someone else to speak. Uh, so just, you know, being mindful of how much space we're taking up. Um, take lessons, leave stories. This one's a little tricky because we are being recorded and we are, we are being live streamed, which means we cannot guarantee confidentiality at all in this space. So being mindful of what what personal stories we're sharing um, and really encourage folks to take the lessons that we're learning in this space uh, instead of personal specific details. Uh, with the exception of if I share something personal about my own experience, feel free to tweet about it um, if that's something you do. Um, trust intent, tend impact. Sometimes when we say or do things, uh, that intention doesn't match the impact, that how it lands. Um, and so we are inviting folks to really be mindful of thinking about how did, how did um, that, oh, I just, my view just changed. So I just got thrown out. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I was spotlighted. Okay. So um, pending that impact and um, being open to receiving feedback. Uh, when someone shares with you that something you did may or may not have caused harm. And we're going to talk about receiving and giving feedback later today. Uh, prepare for non-closure. Two hours, while it seems like it's a very long time, it's also extremely short. And so you might leave the session with more questions than you had. Uh, but that's, that's great. That means your wheels are turning, your gears are going, uh, and there's always opportunity to keep learning more. Um, stay present as much as possible. So turning off notifications, again, please tend to all of the needs that you have. Um, and have fun. Uh, I like to have fun in these sessions. Micah likes to have fun in these sessions, so does Zora. Um, I also used to do stand-up in New York City. I'm an improviser. So when I make jokes, uh, please laugh at them if you think they're funny. <laughs> Otherwise, it makes me feel silly. <laughs> Thanks, Micah. Um, and finally, another uh, just a quick uh, logistics. If you have questions, um, I can't see, Mike and I can't see everybody. So please feel free to come off mute. Um, if you're raising your hand, either virtually or physically, uh, we might not be able to see it. So please come off mute. Or if you want to ask us questions in the chat, if you want your question asked but not attributed to you, you can private message Zora, myself, or Micah, and we're happy to answer those questions uh, and not say who asked it. Um, I think that's it for the Kava note. So Micah. Yeah, amazing. And I will I will check in with Rabbi Moskowitz. We are running uh, Otter Live transcription during this session for those who want to be able to follow along visually. And I believe have instructions already been presented on how to access that transcript. It is in the chat. It's the very first um, link that's there. Just click on it and people should be able to, to see it in real time. Beautiful. And for any questions related to accessing that, Rabbi Moskowitz will be your um, your first stop logistically. And for participation, we welcome verbal participation and chat participation. Either avenue, um, we want we want as much access as possible in this space. Um, so we're going to jump in, and I want to have a little bit of a conversation about the why um, and sort of how to think about how to think about this concept of allyship. And one of the quotes that really sticks out at me is this moment from the Gemara where we're taught that Kol Yisrael Arevim Zebazeh, right? That all of all of Yisrael, all of the Jewish people, are intermingled, responsible. Um, literally, this word means like the collateral on a loan, R-A-V, right? That sort of when um, when you might owe something, there's there's a piece of property that's pledged to to stand in and back up your debt, right? And each one of us is that piece of of sacredness that is pledged for the other, right? That there's this sort of this way in which allyship is not necessarily. Um, it's inherent to being in community with one another, right? That whether we choose to or not, in so many ways, we are on the line for one another all the time. And so when we think about allyship, I tend to think about uh, being intentional, being directed, um, and being being active, 
in that sense of being arevim, of being mixed up in one another, of being collateral for one another. Um, so that's one sort of one taste, one framework that I want to offer to folks. Uh, we're going to get started, and I want to take us through a couple of quick definitions. Um, there are a lot of different things that people might mean when they talk about the concept of allyship. So I want to share with you what Keshet means. And Dubs is first. We first have a think pair share. Gonna say wait. Oh my gosh, you're <laughs> right. We do. So important. So that's excited. what I get for trying to anticipate the next slide without flipping the slide first. And we're going to talk about anticipating uh, needs and also um, being present to understand uh, instead of jumping ahead. So thanks for modeling that so beautifully, Micah. Uh, so right now we are going to do a think pair share. We're going to going to get our empathy wheels moving, greased, I don't know, um, and thinking about a time when you had to speak up about something that was unfair or wrong. So thinking about either for yourself, if something um, was unfair for you and you had to advocate on behalf of yourself or when you advocated on behalf of somebody else. So take a quick uh, few seconds to think about that. And then Zora is going to put you into Havruta, into pairs, uh, and you'll have the opportunity to share. You'll each have three minutes. You'll be in breakout rooms for six minutes. Um, and our guiding questions are, what prompted you to speak up? And was anything difficult about it? And what was the outcome? Um, so the, all of that is in the chat. Um, and so are there any questions? So thinking about a time when you had to speak up about something that was unfair or wrong. Uh, any questions before we uh, send you off into your breakout rooms? I have a suggestion Ooh. because I know people are going to do this anyway, but especially because they're coming together from so many different places. Please introduce yourself to your mm. favorita mm. before you jump into contact. Content. Beautiful. Relationship <laughs> is good. Relationship is everything. Great. All right. Well, we will see you in six minutes. Welcome back. So we we would love to hear from you. Um, would anyone like to share um, either what prompted you to speak up or it, was anything difficult about speaking up and what was the outcome because you spoke up? Uh, feel free to come off mute or if you want to put in the chat, that's also totally fine. This is Debbie talking now. Hi, Debbie. Hi. Um, so what um, Joanna um, and my husband and I spoke about really was um, our adjustment uh, that our children have come out within the past year. And, um, you know, the, uh, the learning process and the recognition of having to be so conscious of pronouns and um, going from the comfort of saying my son to my child, um, that this is all an adjustment, that um, it's, you know, it's a journey for us. Thank you so much for sharing. I want to uplift three words you said. Hopefully I can remember them. Process, adjustment, and journey. Um, something really important to keep in mind when we are thinking about what is allyship and how can we show up in solidarity with trans and non-binary folks, um, that it is, a, it is an adjustment for everybody um, and that it's a journey um, and that um, we're in this process together um, and how can we show up in the best, most affirming ways uh, to, to, the, to the folks in our lives who are taking the brave steps and the, the necessary steps to live authentically. Uh, so yes, thank you so much for sharing that, Debbie. Anyone else like to share? I'll share one thing. It's not a specific story, but just sometimes I find it hard to find the right words, so to speak. Um, and that is, I guess, a barrier to speaking up, whether it's in person or online, you know, people are fearful of like just being attacked virtually if they don't say something completely correctly. So I think that that's like part of a barrier to speaking up and part of like why I'm here. Great. Thanks for sharing that, Mara. Yeah, absolutely. You know, something that I also uh, tend to get frozen in sometimes is 
am I going to say the wrong thing? Am I going to make things worse? Um, and what, what I have found personally from, as, a, as a trans person moving through this world is that I would much rather see an ally or hear an ally make an attempt at trying to intervene with harm versus ignoring it. Because I at least feel held and I feel seen um, versus someone just letting it slide. Um, and what we're going to be talking about today is um, ways of receiving receiving feedback when you get it from folks of if, if there is an oops that's made of, okay, I'm just, we are doing the best we can with what we have right now. And how can we continuously be on that, pro be on that journey in this process of continuously doing better um, and knowing that language and um, ways in which trans folks want and, and need to be affirmed uh, shifts, shifts over time as we are learning more about identity and learning more about society. Um, so thank you so much for bringing that in, Mara. I know you are not alone in that. Um, so thanks for naming that. Um, anybody else uh, feel like they want to share before we keep moving? Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. Um, and Micah, now it's uh, now it's definition time. <laughs> now it's definition time, right? We're going to give ourselves a working definition uh, so that we we have a sense of what we mean when we talk about this whole allyship concept. So for us, the definition that we are working with um, is allyship. Again, that word that you lifted up before, Dubs, the process of being in relationship with people who hold a marginalized identity that you do not share, using your own platform, privilege, or power to work with them to increase safety, dignity, and belonging for members of that group. Um, so I'm gonna pause, cause that was like a, a wall of words and I want to pull out a couple of these components, right? We talked about process. There's no such thing as getting it right or being done or, or sort of engaging in acts of allyship in ways that are going to be perfect. Um, it happens in relationship. Um, and it happens, we talk often about solidarity when we stand side by side with people who maybe share some of the marginalized identities that we experience and stand up and step in for one another. And when we talk about allyship, we're actually adding into that a layer of um, having different experiences, different platforms, privileges, or, or access to power in different ways and using that and leveraging that on behalf of a group that one oneself isn't part of. Um, and I also want to highlight that we said to work with um, rather than to work for. That again, we want to really focus on, on this notion of being in relationship. Um, and relationship, both because it creates accountability and it also creates a lot of room for imperfection and for growth and for knowing that it's, it's messy and we're all kind of in it together. Um, so those are the things I want to pull out of our definition from part one. Um, and just to say a little bit more on that theme, right? We're also noting here that allyship is action oriented and it's accountable and it's ongoing. So we tend to shy away from using the term ally as like an identity word um, and using the term ally as a, a, an action word or an in the moment, action, uh, in the moment word. Um, and being an ally does not always look the same as in one situation as another. Um, and also fundamentally being an ally doesn't mean getting everything right. Um, it means by definition, right, that sometimes one won't. And it means listening, learning, and growing when that happens. Uh, because I guarantee that all of us, as we step up as allies for one another, we're going to wish we had done something a little bit differently or we're going to see room to grow. Um, I want to pause. I want to breathe. And I want to hear if there are reactions, questions, thoughts, anything that comes up for you when we look at this as a, as a working definition of the term. And again, I can see some of you at any given moment, but if you're, if you're trying to catch my attention to speak and I don't see you, come off mute and say what you need to say, and, and we're here for that. I want to say something. Uh, just Do wanting to, to uplift these, this idea of imperfection. Again, I think it's just so important to keep 
to keep thinking about because uh, that's actually where the the beautiful learning. Oh, I'm being spotlighted again. Uh, the the beautiful learning happens, uh, right? So in thinking about those moments where you know we could have done something a little bit differently or accidentally misgender somebody, it's in that moment of imperfection is going to create those synapses in our brain and it's going to create new language and new literacy for us to keep showing up in different spaces based on an imperfection that might have happened. Uh, so just really, really wanting to name that in, in making the effort is actually, and making a mistake is actually a really important part of the journey. Yes, yes, amazing. And somebody is mentioning again anonymously, and we are going to dig into this a little bit, uh, carrying carrying multiple identities and thinking about what does it mean to um, hold identities that are marginalized in some ways, identities that are granted a lot of power and privilege in other, way, in other ways and sort of sit with all of that at once. And we are definitely going to dig into some of that um, coming up. So thank you, thank you for making sure that that is on our, uh, on our agenda. Um, so I want to take us to one other definition, one other sort of um, working definition of a term. We talked about allyship being action oriented, um, and I want to talk about some of those actions being framed as interventions. I know this might sound a little bit social worky um, for some of us, right, that often intervention just means a thing that you do. Um, in this particular case, we're talking about actions that are intended to prevent, interrupt, or mitigate harm of a person who is marginalized in a particular setting. Um, and something else that I want to highlight is when we think about uh, interventions, we might think about things happening in an interpersonal level, right? The, the person makes the joke or the comment or uses the phrase that either they do or don't know carries particular connotations, and we say something, right? That's an interpersonal intervention. Um, interventions might also be happening on an institutional level, right? Realizing that, um, realizing that there might be something that is happening or not happening in an institution that creates a barrier to access and speaking up, working to make it happen, dedicating time, dedicating att attention, that is also an intervention. Um, we're going to spend a lot of our time in this training talking about some of those more interpersonal type interventions. We're going to be talking a little bit less about the how-tos of policy change and activism and much more about when something happens, what are some options for stepping in um, and for, as, uh, as we're seeing in the chat, and for not staying silent because being silent isn't actually being neutral. It isn't actually staying out of it in the moment. Um, and just to sort of bring us bring us down to it, uh, one of my one of my favorite ways of thinking about allyship is, you know, if you've come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Um, and this is this is just to me really shifted. How do I think about it when I'm seeking an ally, and how do I think about it when I'm trying to be an ally? Um, Zora has just placed in the chat a couple of tools that we use when we think about the sort of institution level things. I'm going to refer you to, to copy those links, to click those links, and to save them for later. Uh, one of them is about statements of inclusion and non-discrimination policies. What are some of the things that might happen at institutional levels? Um, and she's also linked an institutional self-assessment audit tool that folks can use to uh, look at your institution and get a sense of are are there things that we can be working on? Are there things we're already doing? Um, so those are there for your use, and we're going to spend most of our time talking about the interpersonal. Um, here's the piece that I promised when someone brought this in in the chat. When we talk about marginalization, oppression, centers, and margins, we're talking about always, always, always more than one thing at any given time. Um, so there's a lot of words on this slide that I've just brought up. It's a chart called the Matrix of Oppression. Um, this particular version of it happens to have been created by some folks at the University of Colorado. Um, and it talks about a number of different categories around social identity and outlines um, on, in all these different categories, some groups are given privilege, some groups are targeted, some groups really live on the borders. Um, and it also names out some of the isms, right, the biases that underlie that. So when we talk about race um, in this particular time and place, 
a tremendous amount of privilege is given to those who are white or Caucasian, and a tremendous amount of current and historical targeting uh, happens towards people who are Black, Asian, Latinx, Native, Indigenous. Um, and there are many people who live sort of on the boundaries and on the borders and experience uh, either sometimes what we might call conditional privilege or temporary privilege, um, and also some elements of being targeted. Um, and that is the that is the framework that we use when we think about race, when we think about sex assigned at birth, gender and sexual orientation, class, ability and disability, religion, uh, and generations, right? And we could we could expand this list. But what I want to invite folks to do is to take a minute um, and and think about those categories, think about privilege, and think about marginalization and being targeted. Um, and I want to. I want to offer you the invitation to think of one of those categories in which you might find yourself um, holding privilege based on this system and matrix of oppression that we live in. And also think about a place where you might find yourself either living on the borders or experiencing being targeted. Um, and just sort of just sort of make a note for yourself of that both and. And I'm going to pause and give folks a minute to do that. We've got some folks in that both and space. We have some folks still digesting. I'm seeing a couple of nods. Um, that both and space is really important, right? When we think about what does it mean, what does it mean to try to hold the nuances of the different ways in which we might interact with the very, very broken world that we're living in um, knowing that for none of us is having that. We talked about platform privilege and power. Um, for none of us is it universal in all circumstances and in all cases. Um, and also, almost all of us have some ways in which we can access platform privilege or power, which are not all quite the same thing. Um, and so really encouraging us to not think about this as, as all or nothing. Um, and to think about how are we allies along multiple axes of identity at once. Something that was pointed out is that the uh, the ways in which, for example, someone who is white and abled and trans might be experiencing um, discrimination or bias might be very different from someone who is a person of color who is trans or someone who is disabled and who is trans uh, or someone who is many of those things all at once. Um, and thinking about not always defaulting to the um, exactly the same except for one difference notion of work for equality or work towards allyship, but thinking about uh, as much of it at, at once as we can. Um, because really at its core, all different forms of oppression, they carry different historical weight, they carry different um, specifics, and often they use the same tools, often they impact the same people, and often they are very, very fundamentally connected and rooted in one another. That's what I'm going to say as far as framing. Uh, and Dubs, I'm going to pass it back to you. Great. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to uh, start talking about microaggressions or micro behaviors, um, which I'll, I'll define in a moment. But thinking about um, how these the word micro might make us think like, oh, it's just it's not a big deal. It's a small interaction. But really what that micro is representing uh, an interaction that's an interpersonal interaction. So it's a small on a small scale in that way. Um, not that it's that it doesn't have as much of an impact on somebody. Um, you might be thinking, what is, what are you even talking about? Well, I'll get there. I promise. Uh, so next slide, please, Rabbi Micah. Uh, so uh, Rabbi Judah Hanasi says, be as careful with minor mitzvah, uh, with a minor mitzvah as with a major one, for you do not know their reward. Um, and so really, really keeping in mind that uh, the impact of our words and the impact of our interactions, no matter how big or how small, they really do matter and they add up. Uh, so next slide, please. So what are microaggressions, Dubs? What are you talking about? So micro uh, microaggressions are defined as the everyday, subtle, intentional, and sometimes, and I would dare to say mostly 
oftentimes unintentional uh, interactions or behaviors that communicate some sort of bias towards uh, historically marginalized groups. Uh, this particular definition is from Kevin Nadal, uh, but was actually initially coined by Dr. Daryl Wing Su when speaking about um, race and racism um, and um, adding that sometimes micro and, and then within the last 20 years, excuse me, um, has expanded the definition of microaggressions to include um, other marginalized groups, uh, thinking back to the the matrix of oppression that Micah shared. Uh, so off, uh, microaggressions often appear to be a compliment or a joke, but often contain a hidden insult about groups of people. Um, so before I kind of move any further, uh, we have created a handout for you that has um, a whole list of ways in which microaggressions appear. Uh, we'll go through a few of them with you, but uh, Micah and I spent a lot of time going through and, and thinking of as many as we could, uh, because some of those, uh, what we think are innocent uh, statements or comments that we are saying about folks of different gender identities um, are actually really harmful. Uh, so we've we've really uh, expanded that and hopefully it's helpful. Uh, so Zora just put that in the chat. So feel free to peruse as we're chatting. Um, so a lot of times microaggressions are rooted in implicit bias. Uh, so Micah, if you don't mind going to the next slide, uh, implicit bias, uh, also um, this was adapted by Dr. Sue, um, are the attitude stereotypes and assumptions that we're not even aware of and run counter to our consciously held values. So this took me a really long time to internalize of the ways in which I interact or show up in spaces and, and the, that I react in certain moments might actually not align with my, my values because of the ways that my brain ha has been wired. Uh, so these implicit assumptions can impact our everyday choices and particularly when we're under stress or in a hurry. So when, one example that I learned um, that I think is a really helpful way to illustrate this is... Um, when you're in a garden, and I learned this from a teacher, uh, Dushal Hackett, about implicit bias. Um, when you're in a garden and you glance in the corner of your eye and you see a snake. So what happens when you see a snake? All of your alarms are going off in your body and you're trying to figure out fight or flight and you are assessing the situation as best you can, right? And then you take a second, you take a beat and you realize it's actually a garden hose, right? So it's, a, it's an initial reaction uh, based on um, assumptions or, or beliefs that we've had. Uh, and then our body goes into, I got to figure this out, uh, which then um, impacts how we then move forward in that interaction. So really taking the time to take a beat, take a breath and be like, what are my actually held beliefs and values in this moment? Um, so before I keep going, are there any questions about microaggressions, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to give more examples of uh, examples of that in a moment, uh, but of microaggressions or implicit bias. Okay, great. So uh, next slide, please. So thinking about these quote unquote small actions uh, actually have a, a really large impact. And so a lot of studies have been done on, um, you know, if you think, oh, well, you know, it's not a big deal. It's just like one offhand comment, but actually it has a cumulative effect. Um, it has a psychological impact and it's in line with trauma, trauma um, impacts. Um, and so it's associated uh, with anger and depression, anxiety and lower productivity, uh, which then makes environments less affirming and validating for folks. When, when folks are, you know, entering a space and are constantly, um, I don't know if on guard is the right word, but maybe maybe it's the right way to say it of, you know, where am I going to be misgendered? When, where am I going to be unaffirmed? Or when am I going to feel erased? Uh, really makes it challenging for folks to, um, to show up and be present and give their full selves. Um, also associated with headaches, loss of sleep, et cetera. Um, and a lot of times uh, because these microaggressions or these quote unquote small impacts seem innocent or they seem like they're not a big deal when folks share that with with folks in in power or at colleagues um they're often told that they're overreacting or they're too sensitive or sometimes that they're aggressive um and uh, which actually really minimizes and erases uh someone's real lived experience that's actually very harmful um so an example i'll give and it's kind of highlighted uh in the next slide 
Um, this is taken from a comic a graphic novel called A Quick and Easy Guide to They Them Pronouns. Um, and it's an image of a person holding a backpack. Um, and essentially, I think about this too as I'm moving through my day, which happens less now because <laughs> I'm just bound to this room and I'm not really out and about uh, because of pandemic reasons. Um, but when I'm in the real world, every time I get misgendered, or someone says something that's, uh, you know, it's a microaggression or um, some in some ways it feels like a brick or a rock is being added to my backpack, right? So as the day goes on, I, my capacity lessens because this bag is getting so heavy. I'm tending to that backpack and I'm not able to be present, you know, as present or as calm or as uh, uh composed as I'd like to be um, when it comes to addressing harm that's happening. Um, so this is just another example of how this is cumulative. Also think about each microaggression as a mosquito bite, right? One is not such a big deal depending on how itchy it is. Uh, but when you, if you have many, many, many mosquito bites, it is unbearable. Um, so also in the in the document that Zora pasted, there are uh, more articles you can read and there are videos you can watch. There is one that is clearly marked that it is not safe for work because there are some F-bombs. So just want to be mindful of that. But it is a very powerful video, which is why we included it. Um, so on to the next slide, please. Uh, so these are some examples of microaggressions uh, that that happen um, you look so good. I would never would have guessed you're trans, right? Or I had no, you know, and so this is sending the message that being trans is not good because you're saying, I never would have guessed you're trans. I don't even think of you as trans. Um, and also that being cisgender is the ultimate goal, that every trans person wants to pass as cisgender is not true. Um, and so sending, give, sending that message is harmful to a lot of folks. Um, I'm not going to go through each of them because I want to be mindful of time. But so these are just a few of these, a uh, few of these microaggressions. Again, Micah and I, I think there might be close to 20 in that document. We we spent a lot of time on it. So uh, hopefully it's helpful for you um, in going through. Uh, the last one I think I will uplift is, but I'm a grammar nerd and they, quote unquote, for one person just doesn't sound right to me. I'm not going to use plural pronouns, quote unquote, for one person. Um, so this is implying that one's own comfort or sense of, quote unquote, correct grammar is more important than someone's dignity. Uh, and also um, just a friendly reminder that they then pronouns are singular pronouns. Uh, we use them all the time as a singular pronoun. Uh, someone left their cell phone on the table, so we have to get it back to them. Or what time does their flight land? Or what time is their appointment? Right. So we actually are already doing this all of the time. Uh, it's just on us to reorient and to uh, rethink about how we use that set of pronouns um, while keeping someone's dignity uh, first and foremost in our brains. Um, lastly, oh, Micah, please. Were you going to? No. Okay. Uh, so, I, I have a thing to say, but finish with, uh, finish with this piece first. Um, I was going to move on to the next slide. So if you want to. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to highlight something that was happening in the chat, which mm. was trying to get a little bit sharper on the relationship between implicit bias and microaggressions or micro behaviors. So I just want to repeat out loud, um, implicit biases are the collection of subconsciously held assumptions or beliefs or attitudes. Uh, everyone has some. It's not like a, a thing to be ashamed of that we have them. We are raised in cultures that really um, give us messages again and again and again and again uh, that cause us to develop any number of biases. Um, so those are the implicit biases. And microaggressions are a subset of actions that outwardly communicate or uh, enact those biases into the world, right? So often the person who might say, you look so good, I never would have guessed you were trans, is not walking around consciously thinking, gosh, everyone wants to be cisgendered. Being cisgender is so much better than being transgender. But there's sort of this uh, thing that happens in which that person might be intending genuinely to give a compliment and that assumption sort of frames um, it, or is framed in that sentence that is being said, right? So those are, th that's the relationship between those two concepts. 
Did that was that helpful for folks? Amazing. Thank you, Micah. Um, okay, so how can we act against now that we've become aware of what implicit bias is? How do we start mitigating? Um, so again, being aware um, of our own biases and fears is a, fir- a great first step to know that they exist. Um, seeking out interaction with people who differ from you. So whether that's in terms of race, culture, gender, um, just getting to know someone. And and I don't know if this is humanizing, I think maybe is a way to, to talk about that of um, I'm actually going to be in relationship in community with someone. And so it's going to start to change the way that I think about a certain subset of people uh, because I now have a personal relationship. Um, trying not to get defensive, um, which can be very challenging for all humans <laughs> um, because I think um, a lot of times, and we're going to talk about this more and more, of that, that it can feel like a personal judgment. Um, when someone corrects you or asks you uh, to make an adjustment that's affirming, it can feel like, oh no, I'm a bad person. When it's really, we're targeting the oppression, we're targeting the harm, not the person who's enacting the harm. Um, And so again, uplifting this idea of we want you to try, we want you to be in it with us um, and that mistakes are going to happen. But, and so when when you receive feedback, uh, it's not because you're a bad person, it's actually because We want to be in relationship with you and we want to keep building trust and community. Um, So being open to discussing your own attitudes and biases and how they might hurt others. Um, I've I've gone through this. I'm still very much in the process of learning and relearning and trying to figure out the best ways to show up for my trans and non-binary siblings and uh, folks of different races and religions and wanting to make sure that I'm, I'm being the best person that I can while also knowing that I'm going to make a mistake. Uh, and how do I move forward from that? Um, and then finally, uh, which is why we're here, which is being an ally by intervening, uh, which is exactly what we're talking about. So these, these again are, are, uh, specifically pulled from research by Dr. Sue, uh, which is also highlighted in the document that Zora put in the chat. Um, and a bonus tip is that peruse the many examples of microaggressions that are on the internet in articles and research on social media. People are so uh, open with telling you when something is a microaggression. Some, lots of people, not all people. Uh, but if you go looking for it on the internet, you'll find it. Uh, so um, once you are hearing about how these are affecting people, um, you'll become more and more aware in each time. Um, and then suddenly you'll notice that you're, uh, you are less likely to continue a, a, a harmful pattern. Um, and the last bonus tip that I want to share with you is um, embracing empathy and thinking about moments in which uh, someone made an assumption about you, whether it was because of uh, your class or your religion or your race or your gender. Um, what did it feel like? What did it feel like when someone made an assumption about you and said something that was hurtful? Um, And what would you have wanted someone to do in that moment? Um, And really, really digging into that idea of empathy um, and being in community with one another. Um, Any any questions before we keep moving? All right, well, Micah. Okay, we're going to move into this this next section. We've given a little bit of a framing of what are some of the things that are are happening in the world that we inhabit. Um, and I actually want to invite folks, if you've been sitting in the same position for a while and need to move, I'm going to stretch out a little bit, uh, make sure that I've got my water full. Two hours is, uh, even with a break coming up, two hours is a while to be in one place. Um, and I just, I need to shift around in my seat. Um, So we're going to talk a little bit about some interventions, things that we can do to to step in, to speak out, um, to do something about things that are happening in the moment. Again, we're going to be focusing primarily on some of the interpersonal rather than the institutional level interventions. Um, And we're also... Some amount of what we're talking about will apply to things that are maybe openly transphobic, um, and some of these are going to be about how to how to intervene in things that are going to fall under that microaggression category, right? Where somebody may not be aware that uh, a way that they're speaking or a thing that they're doing has an impact, um, and both of those are are kind of 
bound up in there. So, um, and I want to share that most that much of this material in this section is adapted and abbreviated from a phenomenal resource called the Evaded Issues Strategies Resource, which is developed by Pippi Kessler. There's a link here on this slide as well as in your handouts to her materials, uh, which take which actually share um, a very very long list of potential options for intervening. Uh, when there are harmful comments being made or or situations that are tricky going on, um, but here's here's where I want us to to start. Think about when we are a bystander, right? When there's an incident happening, something that's being said, something that's being done, um, and we have a sense that something about it is not quite right. There's a step of assessment that I want to invite people to engage in before jumping in. Um, and those two things are, first of all, assessing what is the situation, right? What is the harm that's happening to a person? What form does it take and sort of get a sense of the, the way in which that might play out? Um, and I also invite people to take a minute to assess your own capacity and resources in that moment, right? That there are there are times in which one is in a position to use positional power or authority or personal sort of charisma or collateral to go back to that word aravim that we used at the beginning of the training um, or that one really has time to engage in a lengthy way and there might be moments where we ourselves might find ourselves uh, either at risk for if we intervene in particular ways or with limited resources at our disposal in that moment. And it's really important to make that assessment before jumping in. Um, so that's the assessment piece. And we're going to make this concrete. We're going to give you a scenario after the break, and we're going to go through this step of sort of assessing what is happening and what can I bring to the table. Um, but the thing, that, the thing that happens next is figuring out what are some realistic goals for intervention before choosing what to do and what is the strategy to match that. And what I mean by realistic goals um, is that there are, there are any number of goals that could happen with wanting to intervene in a moment. And some of those goals are actually, um, I wouldn't say directly in conflict with one another, but very hard to prioritize both of so one example is that a goal of intervening might be, I need to stop this harm that's happening in this moment. Another goal might be, I need to work with and educate an individual or an institution in order to shift how they behave in the future. In an ideal world, it is great to be able to do both of those things in the same move right? That we can say something that gives the message in the moment, a person stops doing what they're doing in the moment, and they learn, and they or the institution they're representing also has the resources to behave differently in the future. Um, and the truth is, in certain situations, there's this balancing act, right? Being an educator requires a particular type of relationship. It requires a particular type of gentle approach, um, and it's really phenomenal to be able to do that when one can. And there are some times when the harm that's happening in the moment um, calls for an approach that's a little bit more urgent, um, right? That sometimes can make it harder to then follow up. Um, or sometimes those two things happen in, in different steps. Uh, sometimes, based on the amount of power that one holds in a situation, the goal might be, I can't guarantee that I can change future behavior, but I can register that someone wasn't okay with what just got said or what just got done, right? And that is, that's more about sort of sending a message and communicating that a person is not alone. Um, that is perhaps a realistic goal within the constraints of what one is doing in that situation. Um, honestly, sometimes the goal can be to make the right, the outcomes or the consequences of engaging in that particular transphobic action, less pleasant and less desirable, right? That if someone is going to stop and say something every time you crack that joke, eventually it's not as fun to crack that joke, right? Not, whether or not learning has happened, it's not as pleasant to crack that joke if someone always says, hey, that wasn't cool. Those are examples of how goals might differ from moment to moment. Um, and before we jump into some of the specific strategies, I'd love to know, 
how folks are are reacting to that um, and to that notion of multiple goals or prioritizing one or two goals at any given time. I'm seeing a couple of nods. All right, we're going to come back to this. Um, we're going to see it in action when we do the scenario. Um, I do want to note that some of these interventions that I'm talking about, these three here, um, we're categorizing them as indirect, um, which is a reasonably close approximation of what we mean. Um, and so the three potential interventions that we're thinking of as indirect, and indirect interventions are great when um, perhaps you have limited time to engage, perhaps you have to worry about risk in that moment, um, perhaps there are some other sort of competing goals at that time. Yes, and I'm seeing a comment in the chat, every situation is different, so the goals and the responses have to be different. Yes, 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 exactly, exactly. So that's that assessment step before we start intervening, figure out for this situation, what's the best goal. Um, so some indirect options include defusing the situation, right? That can mean making sort of a generic comment, um, or, you know, interjecting something that's a little bit lighter touch and then steering the conversation or the interaction away from that thing, right? So when we're defusing, we're not necessarily engaging in full-on education. We're not necessarily saying, you know, here's the... Here's the history of why some trans people may not have access to that medical procedure you're joking about and why it's harmful for you to conflate that with truly being trans, right? I'm taking sort of a, the example I'm using in that situation because I realized I telegraphed it without saying it is that's the situation in which maybe somebody makes a comment about um, whether someone has had the surgery and therefore is really trans, right? So if you had a lot of time, you might engage them and want to educate them on why that's a problematic thing. If one doesn't have the standing, if one might be at risk, if one doesn't have the time to engage as an educator, diffusing the situation might be, gosh, that's a personal question. Hey, did you see the email that came out about X, Y, and Z, right? That you've sort of named something and moved the conversation on. Redirecting, um, or actually, I'm going to pause before I jump into redirecting. Does that make sense, sort of as a as an indirect option? All right, more nods. Redirecting. It is totally fine not to know everything about the uh, particular topic that's at hand, and still intervene. It's okay to say something like, "Gosh, something about that felt uncomfortable for me." I don't think I know enough about it, but so-and-so does. Could we talk to her? Or I'd love to learn more about this with you. And, you know, here's where we might go find a resource. Or can I send you an email later? Because I think we should, you know, we should dig into that. But there's sort of the ability to kind of direct somebody to other resources rather than to have to be the resource. Um, and then finally, this strategy of actively witnessing as sort of an indirect uh, this one can be tricky, right? That sometimes sometimes having another person who's going to stay present, who's going to notice and understand what's going on, can be the only available route to mitigate harm. So when I'm thinking of that, I'm thinking of, for example, some of the experiences that I might have as a trans person traveling um, and knowing that sort of security procedures in airports can often be pretty invasive. And, you know, there was an experience I was having for a while there was, where there was a particular TSA agent who really needed to call, felt that he needed to call a lot of loud attention to the sort of body that I had as I was walking through security, right? That's a moment where if somebody's there as my ally, they're not actually empowered to stop the TSA agent from conducting a pat down. And they're not actually really empowered to stop the TSA agent from calling out what they're going to call out as loudly as they are. But they sure are empowered to stay close, to be very visibly attentive to the situation that's happening, right? And to sort of convey in that way that, hey, you're not doing this with total impunity. You're not 
alone with someone in order to cause harm, there's a witness to this interaction. That's what I mean when I talk about actively witnessing um, as a type of allyship that is a little bit less direct, but still can be a really important option. Can I add just one piece to what you are saying? I think in addition yeah. to um, to kind of showing in this example, the TSA agent that they are being watched, quote unquote, I think as a trans person, I am feel so held when I know that someone is with me and sees that I'm yeah. being mistreated and that harm is being enacted on me. So it makes me feel like less alone. I feel supported because I'm not yeah. going through it alone. I have a, I have someone with me who understands the harm that's happening. And then knowing that, they might, they're, that they're gonna check in with me and like, that sucked. <laughs> Are you okay? How can I support you? Um, that's also yeah. a really important uh, piece of that. Yes, yes. Thank you for naming that. That's really huge. Um, so these are a handful of indirect sort of lower stakes strategies, strategies that are available at potentially a lower level of risk or that are appropriate for certain situations, depending on your assessment. Um, I also want to share a couple of more direct strategies that are better when somebody does have the time to invest a little bit more effort and energy. Maybe if you'll find that you're at substantially less risk than the person who's being impacted in that moment, um, or if you have a particularly strong platform um, or some sphere of influence that in which you can use one of these techniques. Um, and I'm actually going to name that this first technique, ask questions, this first intervention strategy. Um, it's one that can be used in ways that are more or less direct. Um, you know, a, an example of using it indirectly might be if somebody's making a joke um, in a particular setting, asking, oh, what did you mean by that? I think I missed the joke. Right? It's not quite as direct as saying, hey, I'm uncomfortable with that joke, or hey, there's a bias inherent in that joke, but it will pull that you know, enough to somebody's conscious mind that either they'll engage directly in your teaching or they'll back off because it's not comfortable anymore. Right? If, if somebody has to actually say out loud, oh, I made that joke because such and such group of people is like this. That's something that, you know, it's fairly common for us to understand we're not actually supposed to say those things, right? So by asking the question, by drawing it out, that can move somebody off and they'll say, oh, never mind, let's move on. Um, another, oh, that's a fantastic comment in the chat. I'm going to take a minute to process that once we get to the end of this particular example, because I don't think I can multi-track enough to process it. Um, but another way to use questions that are a little bit more direct, you know, we can, we can use questions and say, Hey, I'm wondering what were you thinking when you, or what, what did you have in mind when you made that comment? Or I noticed that this policy doesn't include language that's going to serve trans employees here. I'm wondering, you know, why couldn't we do X, Y, and Z? Or I'm wondering, how did, this, how did this decision come to be made, right? That we can ask a lot of questions and we can pull out and sometimes they can be the invitation for us to engage more directly. Um, so I'm seeing a comment here in the chat about microaggressions are chait. Chait is a word that can mean sin or missing the mark or misdeed. Um, and asking about rabbinic sources for trans self-compassion and non-trans accountability. Um, that is something that I would love to address either offline, uh, at the break, or over email, because we have a, a tremendous number of sources that might be really relevant there uh, to talking about what do we do when we miss the mark, when someone misses the mark, when we're trying to do better. Um, I want to walk us through a couple more, a couple more potential direct interventions, and we're not going to get a ton of depth on on each of them, uh, but hopefully this will be a taste for us to use. Uh, something that can be really powerful is naming what one saw or experienced or witnessed, right? Being able to not just sort of 
let there be an implication that something was uncomfortable, but say, but be able to say, you know, sort of explicitly, you know, that comment about clothing, about height, about whatever it was, I think, I think it actually could be harmful because of reasons X, Y, and Z. Right? That, that being able to say that very clearly and explicitly is an intervention in the moment. Um, and that can sometimes go along with sharing some data or some broader context, right? Um, so if we're going to go back to that example that I gave before of somebody talking about the surgery or asking a question, and one option might be to sort of defuse the situation, make you know one sort of generic comment and move on. Another option might be to engage directly and share some some information. You know, hey, um, just so you're aware, not all trans people have the same goals for their body. And it's really hard for trans people to access medical care that's gender affirming. Um, and so sort of assuming that that's what it means to be trans really leaves a lot of people out or really can be hurtful. That's giving some data or some context for why. Um, this next strategy, connecting to values, this can be really important. Remember that we said before that implicit bias often runs counter to our consciously held values, right? That when we're under stress, when we're in a hurry, when we're, we're functioning from the like gut level, um, we will sometimes act in ways that aren't how we would like to act or how we would want to be at our best selves. And offering positive value statements to reconnect people to the values that they want to have can be a really powerful educational tool, right? So talking about um, we really want to we really want to address all people with dignity in this space, right? That's a positive connection to values, and it speaks to something that whoever that person is in that moment may have already stated that they want to do. Educating and investing time is huge. You know, as I said, that's not the tactic for let's interrupt this specific instance of harm in the moment, but it is often a, an afterwards uh, way of engaging. It is something that can be an investment in future behavior and future change, right? So this is where assessing the goals for the situation can be really powerful. And then finally, advocating for change on a systems level which is not where we're spending most of our time here. Um, and it actually often doesn't interrupt harm that's happening in the moment, but it is a core part of how we build a world that is going to be a world of dignity and safety and affirmation for people. Um, so I'm gonna pause because I gave, again, this is a long list of possible tools. We're gonna get to see them in the moment. There is more information about each of these on your handout. But I'm curious if you have reactions, if you have thoughts, if you have questions about some of these strategies. Amazing. So I think we'll, we'll keep going forward. I'm going to do a quick time check as well, just to make sure that we are where we need to be, uh, we're three minutes behind, which is not such a shock. Um, so what I wanna do with this last little bit before we go to our break is to mention that um, part of allyship is what happens in the moment and the intervention in the moment. There are also things to be done afterwards that can be a really core part of it. As Dubs acknowledged, sometimes just knowing that somebody is there, somebody saw and what happened, um, and somebody's going to check in, are you okay? That is a huge, huge piece of it. Um, something else I want to name is strategizing together. Sometimes in the moment, we do not have the opportunity to stop and say, hey, you're over here. I know you hold this identity. Somebody just did this thing to you. How do you want me to handle it? Right? There are sometimes ways of checking in, and sometimes things are moving quickly, and we try to jump in, and we try to do our best. But being able to check in and say, hey, I didn't have a chance to check in with you. Here's what I hoped to accomplish, but I'd love to know how would you want me to handle it if this happened again, right? Knowing that agency lives with that individual 
and that all the interventions that we might be taking on are directed at that intervent at that at that individual, right? So making sure to keep their agency front and center. I see the question in the chat, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get into it in a minute. Um, but the last thing I want to name about afterwards is that self care is really important. Um, that it's often not going to be the communities that we are standing in allyship with who are able to uh, or should be asked to provide that care back towards us as allies, right? That if I am using a situation in which I have privilege or power in order to try to interrupt harm, um, caring for myself or finding sources of care for myself outside that person who was most being directly impacted is really important. Um, keeping in mind that sometimes we never get to find out, even after the fact, if what we did was right. Um, but it, it was something, right? It was better than silence. Um, and remembering that the more we step up, up as allies, the more confident we're going to be. It, um, I'll say that it's probably never totally easy, but that over time it can feel more familiar and more comfortable. I'm going to address the question that came through in the chat, which is uh, sometimes excuse me, sometimes when we're in these interpersonal uh, situations, a person might respond with denial or with anger, right? I'm not transphobic or you're too sensitive or, you know, that wasn't really a problem or gosh, you know, can't we joke anymore? Some version of that. What are some, what are some good ways to handle that? Um, and now I'm speaking sort of in a, in a little bit less of a structured way, I think it's going to depend on the situation. There's always that assessment of how much is at risk in that moment, right? That when someone is like in a supervisory position or holds institutional power over, our responses to that might be a little bit different than if we're, for example, the rabbi in a congregation um, or the person sitting next to somebody else at the table, right? That, that those situations are going to impact how we handle that anger or denial. Um, and knowing that sometimes we might not get through that anger and denial, right? So then maybe we're reassessing our goals. Maybe our goals are then about interrupting and mitigating harm in the moment and planting a seed, for learning in the future. Maybe this incident isn't going to be the one where this particular person learns something and shifts their action, but we've planted one seed. And there might be a next time and somebody else will plant the next seed. Or it might be, you know what? This feels really heated. Can we talk next week? See what happens. Maybe next week is different. Maybe there's more direct engagement and maybe there's not. Before we take our break, I'm going to pause for questions. Can I just um, share something, Micah, in addition yeah. to adding on to what you just mentioned? Um, I yes. think that similarly that not every single person is going to be like the best person to, um, you know, step up and do these different interventions. Thankfully, so often um, inside of our communities that there's a lot of different people who play lots of different roles. Um, and, you know, maybe you know someone in this person's men's group or women's group who would be the best person to talk to or this person's spouse, what have you, that there's many different relationships and really leaning on those relationships also to make sure that everyone feels supported and that it's a learning opportunity for everyone. So that's what I was thinking about a little bit. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Nobody has to go it alone. That's so important. Um, so we're going to offer folks a break of five minutes, and we're going to reconvene. I have 2.30. Well, my clock just changed. I have 2.34, so let's reconvene at 2.39 uh, to jump into working a scenario, getting a little bit of practice with some of these tools. Um, I'm going to still be here hanging out on chat, um, and there looks like a folk, some folks who have a couple of questions they want to ask. We are here for that. I am going to pause the recording, uh, and we can pause the live stream, and then we will be back at 2.39 Eastern 
139 Central. See you then. Um, but I want to make sure that we have a chance to actually practice putting some of this process into, into action. Uh, so what we're going to do is share a scenario, um, an unfortunately pretty common, pretty plausible scenario. Um, and then we are going to ask folks to think about that assessment piece, right? What What's going on here? What do I see happening? What capacity might I have to intervene? And what would those goals be? And then practice using one of those tools. Uh, so what we're going to do after we share the scenario with you is we're going to send you off into breakout rooms. You're going to be in uh, pairs. So everyone will have a chance to do it. Um, and I'd love for you to share with each other. First of all, introduce yourselves. Um, this is a group coming together from a number of different places. So we'll ask you to introduce yourselves. Uh, talk about what do you see happening in this situation, what would your goals be, and what tool would you use? Um, and so I'd like each of you to offer that. And then each of you should spend a couple of minutes practicing. How would you say that? How would you actually, in real life, use that tool? Ready? All right, so here's the scenario. Um, Let's imagine that you're in a, in a workplace kind of setting, and one of your coworkers has recently come out as trans, transitioned at work, and they're using new pronouns. Um, and you notice that even as most people in your workplace have gotten used to using their pronouns, their manager, who is also your manager, seems to consistently use incorrect pronouns. And, and actually, when your coworker corrects her, the manager will often laugh it off, or she'll get flustered, apologize, and sort of say something along the lines of, you know, it's just so hard because they them pronouns are just not what she's used to. And then it has it involves relearning grammar, right? That's the sort of tone when she's when she's corrected. Uh, this particular day, you're in a meeting with your coworker and your supervisor, um, and you're there with some external clients. We're gonna, you know, you can imagine what sort of setting this might be in. It might be a business setting, it might be um you know what, I'll leave it to you who the external clients are, but this is someone who is outside of your workplace setting. And as that meeting begins, your manager introduces the coworker uh, and uses incorrect pronouns while introducing them to this group of external stakeholders. So this is your scenario. Um, and what I'm going to ask you to do is when you go, and Zora's going to put the scenario as well as these guiding questions in the chat, you'll be able to refer back to them. Uh, but to go into your breakout rooms and talk about what is the harm that's happening in this moment, what would your goals be for intervention, and what tool are you going to use? So you'll spend a few minutes each sharing that, um, and then practice actually how would you use those tools. And I'm going to send us to breakouts for... Uh, let's say 12 minutes. Perfect. We're going to go for 12 minutes um, and then we'll come back and I'd love to hear how that went. Well, before Perfect. we, before we go, uh, just a reminder. Oh, if you all are still here, um, that's okay, Zora, don't worry. Uh, in the handout that we uh, pasted earlier has the interventions and the goals. Uh, so you can reference that back. Um, and I'm going to put it in the chat right now um, again. So, all right, ta-ta. Perfect. And do we have a scenario in the chat? Welcome back, everyone. I'm really curious how that was. Seeing some nods again. I have the sense a lot of folks aren't quite in a space where they can speak out loud as easily. Um, uh, my computer just somehow dumped me out. So whoever I was in a group uh, with, a woman, my my apologies. I'm just back in. So, are welcome we back? back? I'm sorry. Yeah, we are back. We I don't are know, back. Like, it's it's <laughs> yeah. good. I love you. That's all. <laughs> now I'll turn my. So glad we're back. Well, I'm, I'm curious if someone could share um, maybe a, uh, a goal that you had identified for intervening in this scenario. I'm curious if there might be folks who have identified different goals for what they would hope to accomplish intervening in this scenario. Can I'd like to share if I can. And Do it. Partly because 
I ran into a question and we, I apologize, we couldn't easily, while we were on the Zoom, bring up the handout. So we didn't phrase it in terms of the terminology that you would use. But what we had, um, my partner and I had kind of talked about, well, the, the, the simplest thing is to just start referring to your coworker with the correct pronouns. Maybe a, a slightly more aggressive approach would be when your boss has just introduced your coworker with the incorrect pronouns to say, oh, I think you meant to say, you know, she or he or they or whatever. And, and, and I guess I'd like people's feedback on that. But my question is, is it somehow inappropriate? A, a coworker has transitioned and is out in your workplace, but now you're in a meeting with new people and I've just outed my coworker as trans. Which is the higher goal to get the correct pronouns going or to not in, inadvertently make that an issue and of outing my coworker during a meeting? Mm. Such a good question. So I think there are a couple of things, right? There's, there's an ideal world in which um, after the first time it happens, there'd be the opportunity to speak with that coworker and say, hey, I noticed this happened. What would you like me to do if it happens again? Right. That's sort of like that's the best of all worlds, being prepared, anticipating the agency is theirs. I think the thing that I'd say is um, correcting someone's pronouns does not necessarily always imply outing them as trans. Right. That there are there are plenty of reasons that a person might use a set of pronouns or somebody might misspeak and need to be corrected that don't involve outing someone as trans. In this scenario, we were indicating that this person uses they them pronouns. Um, and while some people who are cis use that set of pronouns, it is definitely more common among people who are trans. Um, but that if somebody is using a particular set of pronouns at work, they're using that set of pronouns at work. And if they're going to have ongoing interactions with this particular group of external folks, at some point, those pronouns are going to have to get corrected and it's going to be more awkward the longer it takes. Um, and there might be certain settings where if there's like a, a one-time interaction where you know you're not going to see them again and this person doesn't want it corrected, you might err on the side of not. But that's only, I think, if you have that information. I think there's also the um, the tool of instead of um, very directly being like, actually, I think you meant to say they them just moving forward, referring to that person with the correct pronouns is a more subtle. I don't know if indirect is the right word uh, way of correcting and also making sure that person feels seen and and valid uh, and their identity is being respected. So um kind of just like rewinding back to really assessing the situation and what feels is going to make the most impact. And it, that can vary from interaction to interaction, um, which forces us to uh, stay on our toes. There's, there's, <laughs> the, there's the concept of Kadesh Alolivayesh, that you should not embarrass, but it goes two ways. Um, it, 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 saying to the... Um, um, a coworker or whoever was speaking, um, perhaps you meant to say, may be embarrassing. Um, I, I don't know whether saying um, maybe you didn't hear uh, that this person prefers to be referred to as they. I don't know whether that's any less embarrassing to the uh, person who's speaking, but it's both the person who's speaking and the person that it is being referred to. It's tricky. Here's another thought, um, and I, I think especially as we're thinking about this concept of not embarrassing someone and whose embarrassment are we prioritizing, like at a certain point, there's going to be some embarrassment in the room. Um, but I'm wondering about what would it be like if somebody mispronounced a coworker's name when, like, and there's no, this is not about somebody being trans, this is not about their pronouns. But somebody simply mispronounced a coworker's name when introducing them to an external client, what would be the matter of fact way that one would convey that information to those external clients um, without assuming that there's a lot sort of laden on that, other than 
yeah, it's disrespectful to give someone's name out wrong. And also mistakes happen sometimes, right? That that might not be more or less embarrassing than the other. I think Eileen looked like you were about to, about to say something. Oh, but you're on mute. I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I agree with the approach that you would casually uh, incorporate those person's pronouns in addressing them or as part of the conversation as soon as you possibly could without actually making a correction to the manager. But then what happens if the manager decides to incorrectly gender the person again? In the same conversation, not even at a different meeting, but the same meeting. What do you do then? Yeah, that's a that's a question, right? That sometimes sometimes there are there's the like intervention that would happen the first time, the second time, the third time. I'm seeing someone put in a chat that this is the sort of thing that does eventually become an HR conversation in many mm -hmm. in many workplaces. I'm also wondering, is there anyone in the room who would take the take the supervisor aside privately later and speak to them about it? Hey, I've noticed you've been struggling with these pronouns and, you know, I mm -hmm. wanted to name what that might be like for so and so. Are there some work settings in which that might work that might go well? I, I see some that, nods. Mm -hmm. I think that depends upon your status within the company or within the situation. There um, certainly, I've taken people aside, to, but I'm in a different position than somebody who might be a lay person within the congregation. Yes, context, context, and that's the that's the sort of why we have this menu um, of suggested strategies and some guidelines that we're sharing with you about how to assess because. There is no one size fits all, right? There's no equation of here's the thing that happens, here's the exact situation in which you are in, and it like, you know, chugs out, this is the correct set of interventions. It's about let's assess the situation, let's assess the capacity, the platform, the power in the moment, and then let's use what seems like it might be the best strategy for this moment and learn from it. Um, and I love, by the way, seeing that for a lot of folks, there was sort of, we didn't actually talk about what was the goal, but it seemed like for a lot of folks, the goal was let's preserve the dignity of this coworker in the moment in this particular meeting, right? Making sure that they get to be recognized and referred to appropriately. This is so rich. We could dig in, in such a, such a powerful way. So I'm experiencing this right now. And I want to ask uh, something for clarification. Having grown up as a lesbian for eons, um, people would always say that my sexual preference was women. And it wasn't, a, it's not a preference, obviously. And I would have to keep, you know, people would have to say orientation or I would say orientation. What is the correct way of correcting someone when they're misgendering someone, can you actually say they would prefer to be called she, her, whatever the gender pronoun is? What do you, can you say, or what's the word? Orientation, preference, it's not really preference. No. I, you know, I'm, I'm a woman, but you know, I'm a man, but I prefer to be called, I don't, I'm, I'm, how can you prefer? Um, that's a really great question. And I think the way to say it is, oh, actually, Dubs' pronouns are they, them. Just very simple, very matter of fact. These are their pronouns. This is what we should be using when we're talking about them. Um, and you're right. It's not a preference. It's not because, because preference um, uh, it implies choice. Uh, and it's not a choice to use someone's pronouns. Um, I want to uplift... Um, uh, some something that I saw in the chat about practicing pronouns, um, which is, as with everything, uh, when you are doing something new, it can feel really hard. It can feel challenging. Uh, and the way to get better at it is to practice. Um, something that, uh, so thinking about um, in, in pronoun uh, misgendering, um, 
I know, um, and also real quick, if, if you could please, if you're not speaking, mute yourself. Um, I'm hearing some background noise. I would appreciate it. Uh, thank you. So um, even if someone is uh, immediately correcting themselves each time, that to me shows a, a great awareness around um, them taking care in my identity. And um, that then keeps me kind of on edge. Uh, and so it's on uh, the people in my life. It's on my family and my community and my teachers and my colleagues to practice. And so it's in the it's in the chat. Um, whether that's I I actually do this too. I practice out loud to myself of oh I, I'll just use my own name, <laughs> but like Dubs is walking down the street. They are frolicking in the sunshine and, you know, just practicing over and over different scenarios. You can, maybe you have a buddy that you, maybe a friend just came out or a colleague came out and you want to get it right. And so how do you do that? You practice uh, because it can, um, it can be a, an emotional toll and it can be really challenging for trans people and non-binary people uh, to constantly being the ones to intervene on one's own behalf. Uh, so really practicing um, and being open to um, when someone corrects you, uh, which then is a beautiful segue into our next, uh, if I do say so myself, um, into our next segment, which is uh, taking in feedback. Um, I do see the warning. Thank you, CBST. I will try my best to talk as quickly as possible. Um, so taking in feedback, um, it's important because this is how we learn. This is how we assess what our community needs, what our people need, right? Is by being in communication in relationship with people. Um, Want to name that there are tips and articles in the document that we gave you. I made it downloadable. Uh, please do not distribute uh, that is for this session only. We are working on making one that's available to spread worldwide. But in, in the meantime, please just keep it for yourself. Um, so giving um, and receiving feedback to identity is never easy, um, especially when someone who holds the marginalized identity is the one giving that feedback. Um, there's a level of risk. Am I going to... Uh, is there going to be some kind of retribution or retaliation for speaking to a supervisor advocating on my own behalf? Um, and so thinking about what's involved when kind of digging a little bit deeper in it and going beyond, oh, this person just corrected me versus, okay, so what's going on and what, how can I adjust? Um, and it's, um, I'm thinking about the risk as well. So, um, and sometimes as, as cis people, uh, sometimes there is less risk involved uh, because of that, that privilege or power or platform or whatever combination of the three you might have, um, which is why sometimes, like at least for me personally, I really am grateful when my cis allies intervene on my behalf because I don't have the energy or I don't have the power or the platform to do it. And so wanting people, I think uh, in some situations, unfortunately, sometimes people don't want to listen to the marginalized groups because they are thinking, oh, they're being too sensitive or this isn't real. Um, but then when someone who has a, an, an identity of power or privilege says the same exact thing, that's when they're able to hear it or that's when they're able to internalize it. Um, so really trying to activate all the different ways that we can start to um, get these messages um, received. Um, Again, wanting to just uplift the idea that feedback isn't about you as a person, an individual, being a bad person. It's about stopping harm and it's about naming the oppression so we can get rid of it. Um, let's go to the, the next slide, please. Um, and so this is pulled, oh, and, and I do want to name that, that that framing that I just talked about uh, was adapted from my dear friend and colleague, Catherine Bell, uh, who, um, is, uh, is wonder a wonderful ally. So want to give her a shout out for that. Um, and so, and this is adapted um, from an article that we have quite frankly, copy and pasted into that document, fully, <laughs> fully um, quoting and giving credit to this article uh, because we found that it is, uh, it is meant for, it was written the art of receiving racial feedback, but have found that it's uh, applicable across a variety of marginalized identities. And it's, provides really powerful examples for learning. Um, and so this particular slide is highlighting the dynamic of when someone with a marginalized identity is providing the feedback. So when we, also when we think about feedback, you might have someone with power giving feedback to someone with power, or you might have 
uh, someone with power giving feedback to someone who doesn't have as much power or vice versa. So thinking about those dynamics as well is really important. This particular slide is talking about when someone with a marginalized identity is giving the feedback. Um, again, wanting to, to highlight the idea that we are we are talking about these um, with a with a sense of being in relationship with people um, and wanting to build relationship and build community. Um, two that I wanna uplift, and I know we're close to, close to the end, uh, but focusing on content, not tone. So if we think back to that um, image of the person with the backpack, sometimes my gracefulness disappears uh, after a day long of carrying a backpack full of bricks, right? So if I'm conveying to somebody that hurt or you misgendered me or what you're saying is really harmful, uh, my tone might not be as uh, lovely as it might be at the beginning of the day when the backpack is empty. So really wanting to understand um, that it, we should be focusing on the content, not the tone. Um, and then lastly, giving thanks. Thank you for telling me. Thank you for correcting me. And then moving on. Uh, feedback is a gift. It is showing you that someone trusts you enough and cares enough about your relationship that they are trusting you with that feedback. Um, and in hopes to continue growing that relationship in that community. Um, we have a minute. So uh, just want to say uh, thank you to, to all of you for being here, for asking your questions, for sharing what you uh, wanted to share. Um, please feel free to reach out to myself or Rabbi Micah um, if you have questions after this. Um, and we hope you have a great rest of your convening and happy TDEV.